Good afternoon, everybody. I'll be doing the scripture out of Psalm 78, verses 1 through 8. My name is Ted Laura. Oh, my people, hear my teachings. Listen to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things, things from old. What we have heard and known what our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from their children. We will tell the next generation praiseworthy deeds of the Lord. His power and wonders he has done. He has decreed statues for Jacob and established the law in Israel, which he commanded our forefathers to teach their children. So the next generation would know them, even the children yet to be born, and they in turn would tell their children. Then they would put their trust in God and would not forget his deeds, but would keep his commands. And they would not be like their forefathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, whose hearts were not loyal to God, whose spirits were not faithful to him. Thank you. Thank you for that reading this morning. We are going to do something a little different today, but let's start out with getting our Bibles, all right? This is my Bible. It contains God's will for my life. I can become what it says I can become. Today, I will study from his word. My mind is alert. My heart is receptive. I'll never again be the same. Amen. So happy Grandparents Day. I going to talk about this and we'll come back and connect what we finished, what we started last week. But happy, happy, happy grandparents day. Grandmoms are moms with a lot of frosting, someone said. Grandfathers are just antique little boys. Never have children, only grandchildren. When grandparents enter the door, discipline flies out the window. You know, and I thought about that, and I thought, that wasn't true in my life. Now, my, my grandparents, they gave me a lot of TLC, but mm, discipline didn't fly out of the window. But things have probably changed. Grandmas never run out of hugs or cookies. That's a good thing, isn't it? If I had known how wonderful it is to have grandchildren, I'd have had them first. Yes. My grandkids believe I'm the oldest thing in the world, and after two or three hours with them, I believe it too. Yeah. An hour with your grandchildren can make you feel young again. Anything longer than that, and you start to age quickly. Grandmother, a wonderful mother with a lot of practice. Grandparents are similar to a piece of string, handy to have around and easily wrapped around the finger of their grandchildren. That's probably true. No cowboy ever was ever faster on the draw than a grandparent pulling out a baby picture out of his wallet. Would you like to see? And it's like, you know, the old commercial, would you like a watch? Here they are. You know? How many would you like to see with our phones now? You know... I, was, I found what I'm about to share with you interesting. I, I, I suppose it's not new, but it was new with the statistics. Sometimes we think maybe grandparents aren't important or it's not the top of the list. But listen to these stats. 6.1 million, the number of grandparents whose grandchildren younger than 18 live with them. Children under the age of 18 live with 6.1 million grandparents. 2.5 million, the number of grandparents responsible for the basic needs, you know, food, clothing, and shelter. These grandparents represent about 40% of all grandparents whose grandchildren live with them. How did Grandparents Day ever get started? Well, I, did, I didn't know till I looked it up, but it was interesting. There was a, a couple in West Virginia, Joe and Marion McQuaid. They had 15 children. Boy, they took that 
you know, be fruitful and multiply. <laughs> really, on, on the, they had 40 grandchildren and eight great grandchildren. And this Virginia McQuaid, or, uh, yeah, uh, Mar Mary McQuaid would not let this thing go. She wanted it, so she petitioned Congress, and the first time it came up, it died in committee. And she went on another, about a five-year blitzkrieg, and she would give them absolutely no rest. And so in 1978, Congress passed a decree that said the first Sunday after Labor Day will be called Grandparents' Day, September meaning the autumn, representing the autumn of the life. And then President Jimmy Carter signed that proclamation. So that's how he came about to get Grand. Parents Day. In a special on NBC some time ago now, the, the, they said the most defining social change taking place is the aging in America. Someone turns 50 every five seconds. People over 50 account for 47% of the U.S. households. Over 85 will double by 2030. Life expectancy during the 20th century was about 46 years. Now it's around 76. That's the average. We live in a culture that's caught up in youth. It's really a culture that's caught up in me or I, what I want, what I like, but it denies the importance of the elderly. In fact, there are groups beginning to call, you know, people in their 20s, let's euphanize everybody over the age of 60. And I thought to myself, I wonder how you'll feel about that at age 59. God told the children of Israel, rise in the presence of the aged. Show respect to the elderly and revere your God. I am the Lord. Let's look at our text. I'm just going to skip down to verse 4. We will not hide them from our children. What he's talking about there is we will not hide from our children the words of God. It is the responsibility of every generation to pass on values that are significant and the word of God and make it live to the, to the next generation. What happens if the majority of those don't teach the kids? Well, that doesn't mean learning won't take place. Nature abhors a vacuum. They will learn it somewhere. They will learn it from friends or they will learn things on the street or they'll learn things from 21-year-old teachers out of college that haven't a clue why they're teaching. But they will learn things. Psalm, 71, Psalm 78 in the message says, pass it forward. Our job as children of God is to make sure that the generations have the knowledge of God that matters. Not just that there's, that there's a God. When I was traveling to Russia, I, I came through Sheremetyevo, one of the airports we were getting ready to leave to fly back to America. And they had some magazines there. And I was always trying to, you know, after Russian for nine months, it's like, can I have some English? And they had a Time magazine there. And it said, 92% of Americans believe in God. And I poked Pam and I said, what happened while we were gone? And then I realized, oh, after I read the article, they're just talking about, well, do you believe in God? Well, yeah, yeah, there's a God. But that never changes your life. That never has an impact on your life. And when you factor that in, that takes a nosedive. Grandparents stand in a very important place. Those who've gone before us and trusted us with important truths, truths to be preserved and transmitted as truth to the next generation. Verses three and four, what we have heard and known that our fathers have told us, we will not hide them from their children. We will tell the next 
generation. That's what a lady named Lois did in her lifetime. We don't know where Lois got her faith, but she passed her faith on to Eunice. And Eunice passed her faith on to a young man, her son named Timothy. This is the way Paul puts it. I've been reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I'm persuaded now lives in you. And for this reason, I remind you to fan and flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of hands. You've got this wonderful gift of faith that's been passed down now to the third generation. You know, the, the content of the instru instruction of the next generation is simple. What we've heard and known, what our fathers had told us. They didn't have a Bible every one of them, every one of them to, to turn to. On the contrary, they had things that were read to them and passed down to them by word of mouth. First time I studied with a Muslim man back in the 70s, we were having a discussion, uh, it lasted months, but anyway, in the process of this, he said, let me tell you how things were transmitted in my day. He was from Iraq. And he, he was just a pleasant guy to be around. He said, well, when we were children, there would be 18 or 20 of us. And every night we would gather around our grandfather and every night one of them got to sit on his lap. And the grandfather would take and tell stories again and again and again. And he said, that's how I learned the values in my culture, which he said in the 70s were beginning to disappear. We don't need Deepak Chopra's The Seven Spiritual Laws of Success or Cornell West's Intellectual Contributions to Socialism or Twisted Views of Christ neopragmatism. We need the word of God. If I could do one thing, you know, sometimes I've thought it's probably you have, if I could go back and redo some things in my life and some things I said, well, you know, I did the best I knew at the time. But if I could go back and change one thing my children, by the time they were sophomores in high school, would have a great understanding of apologetics and how to use it. Many of us here grew up in a time in which we would, the Bible was considered the authority of God. And so we would sit and, and trade scriptures and discuss the Bible that way. But today you may quote from the Bible and someone else may quote from the Koran. I mean, there's a lot to say about apologetics. Our Bible is so rich and so filled with absolutely phenomenal stuff that you could write book after book after book of apologetics on it. You know, the fact that, that Muhammad said, well, I got to spend seven hours in heaven. Whoop de doo Jesus lived there all of his life and came here. I, I need to quit. Apologetics is really, really important. I wish that we could have every one of our children with some viable knowledge of that before they got out of our midst in the high school years. So we need to prepare and help our kids deal with everyday life. Not just guesses, not debate something, but what they are involved in in everyday life. The same God who brought Noah through the flood and the Israelites across the Red Sea and across the, the, the Jordan River at flood time, that same God is still here today among us and our children need to understand that if it's going to help them in their life. Our kids need to know their Bibles. Now, I know many people bring a Bible on their phone. I've got one on mine too. But when I want to sit down and I really want to study and I want to think about it, 
You know, I, I, my memory is just, it's just not that great. It's never been that great. I have to make little notes in the edges of my Bible to remind me to go here or there or somewhere else. We need to teach our children the significance of Bible passages, not just cherry pick a few, but teach them about the passages in context. We need to teach our children how to pray. I remember the first time that I read it or someone read it to me where Jesus, the disciples of Jesus said, Lord, teach us to pray like John taught his disciples. And Jesus said, you got it. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And that's where he started. And he teaches them. We don't just need to assume our children understand how to pray. And we need to teach them how to love each other. So important. I guess I could keep going back, Marshall, to another time, but I think I would, if I did that, I would say that's another one I would emphasize. And then finally, we need to teach them how to worship God. I remember my mother taking a songbook long before I could really read the songs, knew what words were. I knew what the words were, but I, I couldn't put them together. But she opened a songbook and she took her finger and she followed every one of those words across that page every time we went to church. She wanted to teach me from experience. And then I remember seeing, sitting beside her and watching her sing, you know, sometimes full volume but always engaged, involved in worship. The essentials of what our fathers and mothers told us, they really haven't changed that much. The things that, were, that are important to learn. This was kind of a cute story. I don't know if it really happened or not, but I, I, it sounds like it. Where scholars were discussing Bible translations. The first one said, well, I like the King James because it's eloquent, it's beauty, it's kind of has some poetry to it. Another one said, well, I like the, I like the ASV because it's, it's kind of literal and I, I seem to trust it. And the third one said, well, I like the Message Bible because it has modern language and it, it, it reads like we speak. And the third one said, I personally prefer my mother's translation. And they all chuckled and laughed. And he said, she translated it. She translated each page in the Bible into life. It's the most convincing translation I ever saw. I know that there are people who had mothers like that and fathers like that. By the way, you know, sometimes when we preach this, we just assume, I don't assume, but we act like there were no bad parents. If you didn't have good parents, you really got cheated. Our kids need the words to be alive for them, right? Think about this. We will, not hide from their, we will not hide them from their children. We will tell the next generation the praiseworthy deeds of the Lord, his power and the wonders he's done. When I read that, I thought, is, are there any deeds of God that aren't praiseworthy? Oh, if, I could, if I could remind myself, and I thought, Jerry, how can you remind, be reminded? How can you remind yourself of the, the power of of God. Some of you have seen this before, but in 1977, Voyager 1 lifted off. And it was going out to explore things that we'd never seen before. And after 13 years in the mission, it would travel at 38,000 miles an hour, 320 million miles away. In 1990, they gave a signal for that thing to turn around. 
and to take a picture of what it saw toward the earth. This thing took a picture of 60 images and they came back one pixel at a time. You have to remember this, this is on the tape drive. Your phone has more capacity to take and picture than this device did. But nevertheless, they gave it a shot. What will it see? It's, it's just before long, it's going to be leaving our Milky Way galaxy. What will we see? And this is what came back. Now, for those of you in the back, you probably can't see, but there's a little, whoops. It's a little pale dot. How come you're not going over there for me? Be, all right, never mind. Right over here. Just straight out from there across that screen is what's called a little pale dot. That's the earth. We're not even centered in the middle of our own galaxy. Every person who's ever lived or died came from that little pale dot. The God who created it all created that little pale dot. He took it and it was useless and he formed it and he made it to where he could sustain life finally up to human life. And the God of the universe is going to come and live in the little pale dot. And he's going to dry, die for everyone in the little pale dot. I don't remember the occasion, but someone had been talking about a bunch of synonyms for the awesomeness of God. And Rusty got up and prayed and he said, God, with all of that, we still, we still can't touch your grandeur, your greatness. I don't know if that makes you feel small, but it really makes God seem powerful. God who hooked the Pleiades and put them here and and these and this and this. And it says he, he put them all where he wanted them. And the, the sun is there, just the right spot. And the earth is here at just the right tilt. If we could just zoom back from the universe. Oh, this thing, Voyager 1 has lasted longer than anybody thought it would. 45 years. Take a give a month. This thing's been recording information and sending it back. It's been by this planet and that planet. Get online and look for it. You paid the taxes on it. You ought to get over there and look at, see all the images that are there. And so when he talked about here in the last passage, where was I? We will not hide them from our children. We will tell the next generation the praiseworthy deeds of the Lord, his power and the wonders he's done. Wow. Ah, I keep going the wrong way. There's only two buttons. I got to get it right in a minute. According to Psalm 78, something like that is what we need to communicate to our children. On a regular base, our children need to hear from us how awesome God is. I think it's significant that verse 4 prepares you for verse 5, and you say, well, Jerry, that's the way it ought to be in sequence, yeah? But verse 5 talks about the commandments of God and the things we need to keep. And if what's in verse 4 doesn't happen, verse 5 can't happen. Only if we have them, the praiseworthy deeds of the Lord, his power and the wonders he's done. If I have that, I will more likely be faithful to God if I understand that. Our kids need a working knowledge of the goodness of God. You hear the Bible accounts that talk about God's faithfulness to his people. And then they need to hear about God's faithfulness in our lives as parents and grandparents. 
This is what God has done for me. This is how he's blessed me. This is how I've gotten to where I am now. A positive consequence of the instruction found in Psalm 78, verse 7. Then they will put their trust in God and not forget his deeds. We live in a world that's so busy, so crazy, so just sometimes I, I, I could look at a, at a hill of ants and think that's sort of how I feel sometimes about my environment. There's no greater heritage we can give our kids than an absolute solid faith, something they can put their trust in. Money will fail them. Sometimes, sadly, even friends and family will fail them. God won't. They would not be like their forefathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation whose hearts were not loyal to God, whose spirits were not faithful to him. You have a stubborn, rebellious, ungovernable inclined to revolt generation that are on their way. Where, where are they going, church? They're going to the promised land. And they don't get to see it. They don't get to make it. First generation of a million plus people had to just die in the desert. Listen to this. Hebrews says, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as they did in the rebellion. Who are they who Heard, who were they who heard and rebelled? Were they not all those Moses led out of Egypt? And with whom was he angry for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the desert? And to whom did God swear they would never enter his rest if not those who disobeyed? So we see they weren't able to enter because of their unbelief. It's very interesting, this passage is to me. So did they not enter because of their faith or because they rebelled? You see, because of their disobedience and their rebellion, that was a result of the fact that they didn't have faith. And God said, it was a sin too great. You're not going to the promised land. We're about done. It's important for us to acknowledge our sins our hearts because their hearts were not right with God it was easy for them to just run off and chase idols or anything when they were messed up as parents and grandparents when we messed up as parents and grandparents we need to tell our children don't go down this road regardless of how painful it is you know, I remember my father, one of the first few times, one of the few time, first times that he sat down with me and had a real serious talk. First, I thought I was in trouble, and he assured me, you're not in trouble. This is for free. But he began to tell me, he said, you know that my dad died about three months before I was born, and I didn't have a father. He said, and my grandmother, my my." My, your, your grandmother, my mother, was a wonderful, sweet woman filled with a ton of love. And I had three uncles that rode roughshod on me to try to keep me out of trouble. But he said, let me tell you some things. And <clears throat> he laid it out. These things, and I thought at the time, wow, that's pretty cool. That's pretty awesome. And what I, I didn't understand then which is as my dad were pulling these things out, it was causing him the pain of remembrance. I think some things may be important enough to tell our children flat out what we've done and you don't want to go down that path. All right, grandparents can help their grandchildren. They can give them strength and wisdom, some experiences they've had. Maybe we should be reminded with an asterisk, not too many experiences at one time. Grandchildren bless their grandparents with youth, vitality, and innocence. They help them stay young, help us stay young 
at heart. Together, together, parents, children, grandparents, they create a chain linking the past with the future. And even though it will be difficult, a heart chain will remain loyal to God and it will lengthen. It may get frayed at times, but it will never come apart. I am so thankful. In fact, I agree with Marshall's words. There's nowhere I would rather be today than here. In fact, about Wednesday or Thursday of the week, I thought, is it possible that we can move Sunday up a little bit? But to look out at the parents and the grandparents is an awesome thing. And you say, well, but I didn't do it perfectly. Welcome to the real world. It's okay. You can't go back and undo. But you can beam forward with good things to share with your grandchildren that they will truly thank you for long after you're gone. They will remember. I do. Are you a child of God? Are you in this relationship with him that says you're saved by grace through faith? If you're not, you need to be. That God who saw that little dot out of nowhere and created it initially came to us and said, it's pretty awesome. But that's where I'm going to save man. And he came to make it possible that today you could be free of sin and eternity to your home. If you need this, a church home, you need us just to pray together with you. We'll do so as you come while we stand and sing.